turned it on? Am I, am I, you guys are turning me on, right? But I can, okay, we'll see I how the sound is. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. And welcome to those joining online today on our YouTube channel. My name is Carl Dobman, and I'm the dean of the college. At the College of Architecture and Design, we believe that the future of design is multidisciplinary and technological. Given this belief, we offer a range of design degrees that include graphic design, product design, game design, interiors, and architecture. Our design and technology lecture series allows us to engage in design discussions and offer broad perspectives on where we collectively and professionally are heading. Today is our last lecture of the 2022-23 lecture series. To view our past lectures, visit the, the YouTube channel. You can find the link on our website and on our social media accounts. I'm assuming the audio will come back. So, and now, I'm very excited to introduce Dana who's today's speaker, Dana Chapkova, or Dana Kapkova, both. Anyway, uh, she's joining us today. Dana is an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture and directs Epiphyte Lab, a design and research collaborative that was recognized in 2018 as the next progressives design practice by Architect Magazine. Engaging environmental ethics, Dana's design work is situated at the intersection of the built environment and ecology, focused on materiality, embodied energy, and advanced manufacturing frameworks, with a particular interest in thermodynamics and material waste streams. Dana serves as the graduate chair for the Master of Architecture in Sustainable Design at Carnegie Mellon and is a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Architectural Computing, a recipient of the 2019 Acadia Teaching Award of Excellence and 2022 ACSA Creative Achievement Award. She is the 2022-23 US Fulbright Scholar in, and she was in Slovenia Slovakia. I said I was going to overthink all of these things when I go off script, but she just came back from a semester abroad where she was teaching and working. Um, so it's really great to have her joining us today in person, and she'll be at the Affleck House tonight, and so we often host dinners with students. So if students are interested, the, t the first 10 students, maybe they're all going to run, but the first 10 students to talk to Andrea today um, will join us for dinner tonight. There's Andrea. Um, so please welcome Dana, and we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. Welcome. Is this working now? Okay, great. Thank you for joining me for lunch. Thank you, Carl, for practicing my name. Uh, it's a bit of a kind of a geopolitical uh, uh, journey that I uh, got on when I started architecture. So there are a lot of, lot of places from where I come from to where I went to, where I studied, <laughs> uh, that has a very peculiar names, including my own. So thanks for, thanks for joining me. I hope pizza's good. It smelled really good, yeah. I love that you're doing this for lunch and it's really great that you found time to Come and listen to me. Is the audio working? Yep. Okay. All right. So what I want to talk about uh, today is um, a couple different things. My work is really situated around these issues of ecology and technology and how it affects the design. But today's lecture is titled On Politics of Ecological Intimacy. So I want to talk about um, this, the kind of area of, of intimacy as our uh, way of our collective knowledge as we approach design. So it's a bit of a new angle the way I ch usually talk about my work, so, so bear with me. It, this this um, way of thinking is really rooted in the idea of how we operate as designers and how we shape our environments as, as architects and designers 
during climate change? And what are the kind of uh, technological and human paradigms that are entangled within each other that we can really understand and shape and sort of collaboratively really, um, uh, take in into the design processes that are much more tangible to us. I, and you know, there, there's a lot of um, technological advancement that we're all dealing with, especially when you come in as, as, uh, as students and are introduced to um, a lot of different way of thinking. But this idea of kind of accessibility through technology um, that I will talk about uh, through some of the projects is um, really important to me. So the terms that drive my work, both as a teacher, as a professor, as a researcher, as a scholar, and as a designer, are issues of environmental empathy and uh, within the kind of a biotechnological framework of design, where in which the identity of design aesthetics is really critical aspect of kind of localized social engagement that I think is tightly coupled with the issues of contemporary manufacturing um, that I think could really radicalize the way we think about our resources and labor and reposition architecture uh, away from the kind of a extractive model to the model where it participates on uh, as a vehicle for ecological and communal restoration. So thinking about how we make things and what are the connections, I'll talk a lot about the connections between landscape and architecture and what those are and how we represent those are, I think, um, really central to the way um, how I define the term environmental empathy. So um, this is a little article I wrote for a book on um, robotic landscapes, calling Designing Unfinished, and um, really starts to talk about the forms of connectedness, how, did the, what, how do we form the empathy through design is the kind of a form of connectedness with the other or unfamiliar. <coughs> and how understanding the technology as a kind of a distributed accessible model would allow us to retool both the, the work and pleasure in the times of ecological crisis, right? There's a technology is usually associated with this model of efficiency, like just solve the problem. Whereas I think that um, the way we, um, as designers, start understanding um, these tools are also a way how we can kind of find more human connections to the, the larger world that is represented to us through the sort of a, another way of imaging or kind of a technological systems. So in this framework, a connection between architectural landscape or materiality and its territory, where does the matter that we construct architecture from comes from is critical. And I know we all have this kind of awareness about these across scale relationships, human habitation, industrial manufacturing, extraction of resources, this kind of a technology versus intimacy problems. However, they could be much more directly translated into design cues and sensibilities. So how do you perceive, what does the space communicate to you? Um, and how the urban frameworks, and this is a student project that, that deals with the sort of a translation of the urban data into the robotic system then that, um, and uh, mold growth um, that start looking at a different way of navigating urban space. So this kind of a notion of nurturing architecture in a form of environmental stewardship and a question, um, questions the existence of natural materials in, in, um, in landscapes that are filled with kind of post-industrial pollutions. So what, what, we're, what are, we're looking at is also how we start thinking about the, thinking about the resources and, and our kind of self-propagating uh, processes such as in this case sedimentation that um, uses oil rigs to kind of reinforms urban systems, not through extractions, but through um, new ground building processes that are more naturally um, self-maintained. So uh, concurrently with my academic position, I'm a, I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. I direct a um, design research collaborative, as Carl mentioned, Epified Lab. Um, and the studio works is really focused on, on this kind of a framework um, that operate across scales. 
uh, that is rooted through the um, lens of thermodynamic behaviors. So who knows what epiphyte is? Anybody? Carl learned how to say it, so I'm super excited. <laughs> So epiphyte is a, is a plant, right? And, and in some way, the epiphyte in the title of the work is a model uh, for attunement with the environment. Um, so air plants or some air, air plants or some of the orchids are epiphytes. Have you seen in the markets there are the little plants that like hover with the roots open? You've seen those? Right? Yeah? Okay. So those are epiphytes. Uh, what's interesting about epiphytes, they're... Um, they need very little to thrive on their own. They, they are not parasitic plants. They live on other plant matter. Um, they feed off of waste to survive. Uh, there is, and so the, the model of a kind of an epiphyte, which um, I founded with my late partner back in 2009, so we've been kind of, I know ecology, ecology is really a um, popular theme these days, so we've been working on this for <laughs> many years. Um, so it suggests a more natural form of material um, material circularity that are inscribed in organization of architecture or form or landscape. So, and there's a difference between um, this way of working or there's maybe kind of alignment between this way of working with a concept of political ecology um, that operates beyond climate change awareness and beyond the kind of a scientific model of environmental accounting. And this is not to say that scientific model of environmental accounting uh, is unnecessary, quite the opposite. It is important, but that it's always has been kind of co-opted with the, um, or complicit um, with the progress of the capital. And um, what, when I refer to political ecology, I refer to body of work by Jane Bennett, uh, who wrote a book called Political Ecology of Things, um, or a Vibrant Matter that start to kind of talk about a um, different, uh, different um, design approach that allows us to kind of cross over to the new forms of materialism and really investigate not the solution-based attitude towards environmentalism, but the models of ecological disruption in, as a kind of a new form of material identity. So something like this, right, where it's a, the plant on a panel that is like taking apart the um, taking apart uh, uh, the, material art, the materiality of the, the house that had been constructed to move the nature away from its body uh, is an engineering model that, that takes the biomass as kind of a problem to existence of the mat material. Whereas um, in, in Bennett's writing, or the kind of the idea of how we sort of distribute ma matter within the architectural figure, um, uh, is really rooted in the understanding or the Bennett's writing it, that proposes a new hierarchy within uh, construction of what we understand as public interest. And that, that includes all living th things, um, and humans and worms alike. And she specifically talks about worms and how worms are part of the public, and we all talk about participation, collective design, right? Worm as something that essentially does not have a representation as a part of the participatory model. And how we, through understanding, kind of having the deeper environmental empathy through design or kind of ecological knowledge, are able to bring in some of these natural processes back into the architectural space that allows perhaps a, um, it escapes this sort of a um, traditionally defined public um, community design limitation of social collectivism that often, and this is from my personal experience, fall into the hand of top-down model of community saverism. So this kind of a shift away from technology as a positive as humanist concept of industrialization. So Bennett's definition potentially avoids this pitfall and um, that landed idealist modernist architecture in the hands of totalitarian systems. And as Carl said, I just came back from uh, Slovakia. I was uh, right on the border of Ukraine for a while last semester. And uh, this is the area where I grew up um, in former Czechoslovakia during communism. Uh, so these kind of inscrutable industrial environments that were actually born out of this idea of um, socially, um, socially kind of driven structures. 
were really produced as a top-down model, urbanization systems that we inherited from practices previously idealized figures such as Hausmann, Speer, or Moses, right? And the sort of aesthetic purity of modernism and social equalization led to this kind of a large scale homogeneity. You can see that's sort of a typical Eastern European suburb up there um, with about 200,000 people housed within, within that system um, that became kind of a tool of resource extraction and spatial control through power of capital. And the modernist project was really set within a narrative of kind of heroism or idealization of a patriarchal social practice that rejected all the previous histories through the tabula rasa approach and through the centralized labor technology relationship. And this is where the kind of the, the model of technology and human labor that I think we're getting away with or way, away from um, towards uh, the sort of a distributed model of technology that I would like to talk about more. Um, so this model also criminalized the vernacular and specifically um, the Vovan ornament of peasant Slovak women. And I don't know if uh, the ornament crime, it still is a part of the culture of the <laughs> history or reading um, in the school here, but um, this is kind of a so famously disowned by Adolf Loos in his writing, in a seminal text on ornament and crime, where he kind of criticized, ostracized the local craft in, na uh, in name of civilization progress. So how the kind of civilization needs to uh, use the centralized technology to sort of humanize, uh, to, to offer space for everybody, um, which really looked at capital um, industry. It, it, it led towards uh, industrialization and mass production. So, um, however, over time, and going back, this is going back to 80s and 90s, um, way before your time, um, it kind of also unhinged a collective power of undoing of such systems. And on this occasion, by sort of mere act of gentleness, and these are images from um, what's called a Velvet Revolution, which in direct translation there um, in, in Slovak, it's a Nezhna Revolucija, which means actually tender revolution, which was the revolution that essentially did not have a military, it had a military presence, but it didn't have a military action and communicated, and people would like give flowers to the military. Um, I was in high school and this is my sort of a very deep um, transformative experience when, when this was happening. But what, um, so the Velvet Revolution in 1989 became sort of, um, the, the natural environment or a gift of flower became not just symbol of beauty, but representation of a desire for greater diversity with the strength to cause a radical decay, not just of the system, but also of undoing of these industrial systems that, um, uh, that kind of as a consequence started falling apart, right? You don't have a centralized control, sometimes things fall apart. But also it led insight into sort of the emergence of this new ecology and its ability to produce alternative social awareness and spaces and environmental qualities while the kind of eroded rigidities within that spatial linearity of the, the modern aesthetics and, and composition and layout of figure ground planning started literally fall apart. So this ecological opportunism that occurred as a consequence of collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, um, this is our, one of the early projects back in 2010, -ish, 12, um, led to this project called Green Neglige, Emerging Ecologies of Post-Soviet Housing Block, that um, really looked at the um, collective and individual ownership of the housing system um, through uh, the lens of ecological disruption and allows us to kind of embrace the positive effect of weeds or deterioration that dissolved the starkness, and this was happening naturally, right? Um, that is dissolved the stark figure ground um, and allow the kind of a, um, a rethinking of um, individual ownership. Like before people did not own their apartments, it was all collectively owned by state. Suddenly, you know, these are energy hogs. You got, uh, there was this idea, everybody gets their own thermostat, but thermostat was complete illusion because it did nothing. You could just like, play with it, nothing. Um, just because the, the houses, uh, the units were not designed to really be responsive to that. So. Um, 
Um, so what we propose is um, this kind of a tensile building armature as a sort of a gray water filtration uh, system within a building um, using climate analysis um, through which we realize that there is kind of a um, unoccupied third zone between the building um, ground, figure and the ground, um, which is uncaptured by existing modes of bureaucratic control and open to these opportunistic in intervention um, and also resist it to resist the sort of a, um, to trace these climatic hydrological forces, but also resist a, um, a big box development, which was a next step within this area, right? So identifying the formal trends within each urban block uh, was part of the kind of a computational hybrid analysis between um, um, growing wine, uh, filtering water, uh, using it, some of the kind of a, a closed resource loops that would also create a public space. And um, kind of the building, uh, the territory of the building and within an object become much more, more integ integrated and also kind of rooted within a landscape. So the landscape become an instrument of resistance that expand the, the boundary of the public territory in some way to, um, to allow for um, to allow for kind of a much more um, participatory public space. Um, so what I'm interested in is kind of politics of architecture as an inscribed form, or what I call attuned matter, while using computational models, simulation, prototyping as kind of the method of advising, advancing the um, connection between uh, the perceptive form and the invisible forces that that they're uh, formed with. So there's kind of this structured relationship between my research and between my practice. practice. Um, and I never know which one is right and left. Um, uh, so that engaged this kind of socio-ecological landscape through the formal behavior, data, metrics, use of code, but very in scale type of materiality. So on the academic research side, I look at sort of procedures, how we, through geometry, simulation, and prototyping, really understand the dependent the knowledge of kind of inquiry, whereas Epiphyte um, w uh, is really focused on creating a set of experiences that um, engage categories of spaces, uh, environments, and landscapes. So the collectively, the body of work situates architecture as a kind of a hybrid ecology that instrumentalizes various material expressions relative to, um, to the to kind of understanding of the larger geopolitical um, context. For that, and this is sort of more pedagogical, um, understanding um, pedagogical procedures, how you introduce students to the strategies that enable them to experiment with sort of fusing natural and constructed environments, to think of architecture as a, self, uh, as a living self-regulating organism that is attuned to its ecological and aesthetic awareness, the collapsing the behavior and figure in terms of the, the kind of a, going back to the worms and representation. So the use of drawing and simulation are really critical. Um, going away from um, sort of a figure ground relationship to straddling this both empirical and metric based input that navigates kind of a visceral ambivalence towards tension between the determinancy of data and the infallibility of the sublime. So how, th and these are three-dimensional simulation of the kind of a geo, uh, the water, um, the hydrological and geological processes within a specific landscape. And then the material is then always rooted in this idea of ecological instrumentality. In this case, the figuration of rammed earth is being uh, developed through the very low-tech repeatable formwork but um, the form is limited by, let's say, some of the, the material simulation of a ramming. Um, so these emergent technologies, I think, are really important to understand as kind of accessible um, technologies to, uh, that engage also um, uh, tech technologies as a part of a creative thinking and other technology as a, as a form of solution towards a problem that we already know what to do with. So um, these link of these kind of a modes of inquiries uh, are really uh, sort of a space that I start defining as a, as a kind of ecological 
material uh, ecological intimacy with waste streams. A lot of the new materials that we're looking at are um, um, really embedded with um, sense of um, res the, are formed through the kind of a resources of our own anthropogenic waste. Um, how am I doing on time? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but let's talk a little bit about architecture. Um, so the notion of architecture and kind of a, how, are, how these processes instrumentalize architecture, how, what, what are the kind of effects, the invisible effects that architecture makes us both feel or live through uh, becomes important. And the notion of architecture as acoustical instrument dates back to 17th century. And it's associated with aesthetics um, of musical acoustics and sound reflection. So in this context, this is a tiny restaurant in uh, Pittsburgh um, that we designed and fabricated actually with my students that it's focused on specific effect of spatial experience mitigated by the geometry. So the ceiling was inspired by vaulted geometry of ancient Thai architecture incorporating uh, acoustic and um, effects and ambient lighting using three-dimensional ellipsoid vaults. The ceiling geometry supports kind of a sense of individual presence within a small, small collective space. So you guys all been in a restaurants where everything's hard materials, right? You walk in, reflections, you can have a conversation. So the, the whole idea behind this was kind of how can we build something really cheaply? So the ceiling was about $5,000. But how can we soften the effect through understanding how the geometry changes the reverberation frequency and direction of sound that we can both have more private conversation within a, within a smaller space, but also some level of privacy relative to the other spaces. So um, the surface of ellipsoid is materialized through these series of diagonally cut slotted fins to mitigate the reflection. So it's, it really operates like a giant um, diffusion model. And each bay, it's a sort of a diagonal, diagonal uh, grid that each bay is different size and different depth, which um, produces a different frequency of reverberation. Re I can't even say that word. Reverber reverberation. <laughs> so making the global diffusion more pleasant. So it's a sort of a kind of a softening device um, that really also it's tied back to this idea of kind of a super easy construction sequencing. So you can see it's a, it's a very simple way to construct something that produces much more complex um, effect in terms of its, um, in, in, in terms of the kind of a sense of spatial weightlessness, visual expansion as your eye travels over each of the articulated edge. It, it, ironically, when you put something in and you design it well, it makes the space feel better, uh, bigger. <laughs> so there is that. There is a sort of a the, the kind of how do you how do you do that? Is a, it's a fun it's a fun thing to think about. So that was about instrumentalization of sound. Uh, this is more about how um, I work with instrumentalizing energy and temperature. Um, this is a house, a uh, Sioux house that's been built about 2010 and back in, in, in Ithaca, New York, which uh, was built based on passive solar principles. It's a compact house. Exterior surface is um, designed using a solar responsive cement board siding pattern. So the, it's a very cheap standard material. It kind of like slowly changes the color as it, as it looks at the different cardinal orientations. Because as you know, color changes the way we perceive temperature. And the bifurcating roof is organized around a three-story main living space, which um, uh, functions as a spatial nexus uh, as part of a natural ventilation that is linked to a thermal mass. So this is a big chunk of concrete. There is no mechanical air conditioning in the house. There's no air cooling in the house. The house is cooled passively through this, this piece of um, this piece of concrete. What it does, the thermal mass delays the de redistribution of the heat and then uh, the, the circulation of the, um, the heat is then being vented through the uh, double story. So um, what's interesting about this, um, and this is kind of my, my little pet peeve with the environmental accounting and the codification of some of the environmental systems. Uh, so the house was, this was in 2010, the house was 
LEED certified, but we only got silver certification because we didn't have an advanced technology to address cooling. We didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have efficient air conditioning, so we couldn't qualify for the higher lead to classification, so, which is ironic, right? But it's interesting because I, I think you know, um, what I'm trying to um, do through the work is really um, uh, kind of try to build in some of the common sense in a, within the kind of a, the, the, the politics of um, uh, codification of how we navigate between the research and then institutionalizing some of the architecture that actually does good for the climate change. So um, anyway, so the surface of thermal mass was maximized to increase the rate of thermal transfer between the sun, the wall, and the interior environment. So you see there's a little simulation analysis and the, the geometry is kind of responsive specifically to the sun path and it kind of thickened where the um, uh, where the sun is most present and it opens up towards uh, the, the light and air otherwise. And the issue with the thermal mass is historically, um, it hasn't been used as much, uh, primarily because it's kind of ugly, right? Like who wants to put the giant concrete wall in front of your windows facing south, right? You can't see out. <laughs> so this idea of kind of average versus the, the distributed shape that essentially now is part of the structure of the house. It lets the air through, it lets the light through. Kids really love it. They've been enjoying playing and crawling through the hall, right? So it, it, kind of, it's more of a multi-parameter space that really starts looking at shaping some of these sort of a fairly basic systems in uh, response to multitude of aspects, not just kind of an engineering attitude towards what's the most effective um, thermal mass wall. So this project sort of started a new line of research because what we realized that surface figuration, the geometry on a surface, makes a huge difference in terms of the time delay of the heat distribution. And this is a little technical, but bear with me. So um, because the hot air rises, we all know that, right? And the hot air kind of flows in a particular shape, right? And you've seen some of the, the flow, hydro flow diagrams that I was showing in the landscape. It actually flows similarly. Um, so what it does, if you have a same volume and same surface area, the heat distribution based on the engineering model should be exactly the same. But it's not. If you change the, the type of geometry on the surface, you can either speed up the exchange rate between the air and, um, air and uh, the material, or you can delay it. So in some way, this idea of the form of mass regime is a funded research project that kind of looks at architecture, material science, robotics, and mechanical engineering that believes that complex geometries can be used to improve both the aesthetic and thermodynamic performance of passive systems. So, Looking at um, uh, really how we can kind of demechanize architecture, geometry plays a critical role in that in that um, relationship. And um, uh, so this was a project where we sort of digitally modeled um, about 45 panels that are all same volume, same surface area, but they, their geometric figuration is very different. And you can see on the bottom that's just a sample of three where they have exactly same numerical parameters, but they're heating and cooling. You see the, the red is heat, the blue is cool, right? So you sort of see how there's a difference in the way how, um, how they, they, they operate. So, um, and we, we did a lot of additional kind of simulation with mechanical engineering. This was a very interdisciplinary project and uh, physical measurement to be able to kind of isolate and determine the rule set of kind of where, what are the, um, what is the kind of a rule set for actuating the thermal lag through the surface geometry and how the direct contact between airflow and surface area uh, relate to that and to really start thinking about climate-based design more in terms of sort of sculpting the architecture very specifically to not just materials, but to also the kind of aerodynamic of the um, temperature 
and so on. And then there is, you know, machine learning models that we can start utilizing to um, identifying some of these fit, uh, geometric trends specific to the performance values and start kind of maybe generating more standardized geometries that might be climate specific to start mitigate these um, experiences, sort of how we feel in the space together or individually. So there's geometry, there's also color. The, this mass regime research set up the trajectory. Ooh, what is that? That's an acoustic effect I like. <laughs> um, so it set up the trajectory to kind of see what are the other aspects of, uh, um, so this is a thermal color that essentially changes based on the temperature. So how we um, engage color change as a means of communication, how um, uh, that can be part of the way to start engaging um, the ecological systems that root on outside of the building that are not necessarily disruptive to um, the architectural model, as well as um, look at, looking at the relationship between um, this idea of kind of how we subjectively perceive um, temperature and, and how, how the buildings are engineered to, towards a, um, what's called a thermal comfort. Do you guys know what thermal comfort is in buildings? So you know that there's an air conditioning here, right? Who is feeling cold? Who's feeling hot? Who's feeling anything? <laughs> what do you feel? Like in, the middle. in the middle. In the middle. Anybody's cold? Some, some hands are up, okay. So you know, based on our gender, race, cultural background, we perceive temperature very differently. And um, thermal comfort is typically associated the way it's engineered as engineer, and there's been a lot of research done on this with much, with much smarter people than I have, but this idea of kind of, is um, based on our what's called metabolic rate. And uh, um, general guide for metabolic rate of thermal comfort in uh, public buildings is a metabolic rate of 40 year old white male, right? So talking about, <laughs> are you comfortable? <laughs> no. Yeah, I put everything else, right? right, right. So, so this, this idea of kind of attuning thermal surface is a research that um, um, uh, talks about kind of how our bodily temperature is sort of subjectively uh, changes relative to different condition. This is a project in collaboration with some of my colleagues that we look at this idea of kind of architectural as a mood ring, how we can um, kind of start creating the pathways and connectedness between specific forms of biofeedback using kind of human um, psychology and emotiveness to actuate the material expression and um, express it as, as a, there's something funky with the slides, but I'm not sure. But uh, start thinking about sort of architectural surfaces that are kind of thermally activated as a part of a kind of a communication um, device. So architecture is a mood ring. It um, was a project that uses um, sensory effects rooted in thermodynamic to, um, engage um, means of communication with the environment. So essentially it's an um, electromechanically route, uh, cast piece of concrete that changes the color based on the ch temperature and based on your mindset <laughs> presence, right? That it, it's a prototype, it's not fully functional. But this idea of kind of like a wall hugging you, right? <laughs> or being, being somewhere where you can kind of change how you work and where you are in a space, how we occupy architecture relative to these sort of a invisible moments uh, that are maybe more directly expressed in architectural surfaces was part of, the, part of the project. But so what this suggests, everything I'm talking about, it suggests like super intensive formal complexity in everything we make, right? Which if you think about ecology or sustainability, it's kind of problematic in terms of a casting. Every cast is singular, um, it, re it doesn't repeat, so there's a lot of waste. So construction of these bespoke geometry, um, there was another collaboration where we started looking at kind of direct fabrication 
of what's called 3D profiling. This is in collaboration with my colleague, Josh Bart, where we're looking at 3D printing, adapting 3D printing processes to use a robotic arm to actually sculpt the surfaces directly. So it's a moldless, moldless production. So um, it's it, this sort of a moldless making su suggests a very different way of, of um, looking at and understanding um, at the creation, at the creating of the, uh, the the objects through the kind of a distributed robotic methods, and it uses both the deposition and subtraction of soft material. And uh, the idea here that you can start finding um, relationship, uh, um, un better understanding or attunement between sort of how the air moves, how we create the geometry, how the objects are being constructed, and sort of this relationship between shaping um, elements and using technology to radically change the embodied energy of production for higher variability of these geometric inscription is really possible to kind of look at the, in a larger scale manufacturing framework relative to automation platforms that are, that are much more attuned to the variations, especially in a, in a kind of a concrete industry, which we all know is a problem, right? So there's another problem is like concrete itself as a material. So we started looking at changing, um, changing the material properties as well. What's interesting about this that, um, you know, the concrete itself, and I promise I won't show many graphs, um, concrete itself has per unit of its volume one of the lowest embodied energy relative to a lot of other materials. We all know concrete's bad, right? Who, who doesn't know concrete's bad? You know, we, you don't know? Or you do know? You don't know. Well, I mean, there's the whole narrative about how concrete contributes to a CO2 production, right? And a lot of it is the composition of a concrete, a lot of 3D printed production is looking at kind of a different materials to change uh, the how architecture contributes to the um, greenhouse production, right? So what's interesting about it is that if we replace all the concrete with something else, we're probably we're not gonna solve the problem. <laughs> because even if you look at bamboo or wood, because if you look at the resources they need for renewability, if you just exchange the amount of volumes and don't look at it in terms of local culture of making, it's going to be a problem. So another interesting fact is that as of 2020, humans officially became the maker of the planet. So there was a research published by Scientific American that uh, says that synthetic objects made by humans now outweigh the existing biomass on the planet. So we make more stuff than there is a natural environment at this point, right? So what we make the new things from will have to be something that we already produced. So this idea of kind of material circularity, waste, um, is how do we make things from things that we don't need anymore? So this is really important. Um, so there's a research called Crumble, Construction Rubble, Manufacturing for building, uh, building Life Cycle and Environment, which really looks at kind of how we make all these new materials from stuff that is already made. Um, so it's, uh, it's essentially looking at a granular uh, binder jet printing and um, using this kind of a similar idea of a shape factor digital app uh, workflows between, um, between, um, uh, between um, uh, shaping um, elements and kind of understanding elements of strength. So this is a beam made out of sand. It's a 3D printed from sand um, that with some coding systems, it's starting to kind of suddenly producing really strong materials. So what does it mean for how we design all these things? is um, how does it scale up into architecture, how it's potentially linked to this idea of uh, post-industrial context with high level of pollutions. Um, I ran a couple of studios that looked at this problem through the lens of sick soil, like pollution of the soil, how we map the soil, how we start understanding connection between local economy, food desert neighborhoods, and new forms of soil remediation, remediation into construction engaging this technology of granular printing, sort of, sort of thinking about the distributed model of, of um, making architecture from the local 
waste, whether that's soil pol polluted soil or um, construction waste. It starts suggesting very different architectural aesthetics. Um, so uh, this was a studio that looked at uh, implication of this, of, on this in the architectural scale while we were also in a context of these printable forms. This is a video that's, oh, it's running. And um, also this idea of assembly and disassembly. So sequences of architecture that can be directly printed as a part of the excavation process erected in the place and uh, both revitalize the surrounding landscape as well as look at kind of a, this idea of architectural resilience through, um, through the, the technological innovation. This is the last project I'm going to show you, which is finished, which is essentially taking all these aspects of both um, ecological thinking and um, some of the shaping strategies together with um, uh, 3D printing technology into reality. This uh, project's called Rocking Crable, Urban Furniture for Environmental Justice. And we propose uh, sort of these green infrastructure vehicles that are integrated into a green nursery where display object function as urban furniture, water collection devices, planters for native species, but they also carry messages from um, local community. Um, they, um, they currently install, this is uh, from last spring. They're also printed out of sand. Um, the project was, what was really important to us was this kind of idea of co-authorship or collaboration with the community. Um, this is a um, diagram where it sort of starts capturing um, the idea how the, um, the actors in a place, a center of life, who is an active, um, active in the Heidelberg community as an empowerment organization and um, Excursion Unlimited, so also collaborative community driven project uh, for self-determination. Uh, start sort of looking at how we ho uh, raise awareness about natural water management and cycles and their connection to the clean air and soil, um, while also giving the voice to the community. So how as we worked with kids who created artwork, who sort of, in this idea of kind of a graffiti that it's usually also um, something that's damaging to architectural surfaces are being kind of designed into um, through the, the gestural act of of, of kits into the objects themselves. So this idea of kind of co-authoring was really important to us. So we studied the pervasive pollution history and kind of acknowledging that soil pollution and its migratory patterns are dynamic, still present. And also, as you know, there are a lot of urban gardening initiatives in some of these areas that are happening, also using some of the soil that perpetuate these pathways of pollution from and from growing supposedly healthy food into our bodies. Um, we carried forward some of the technology of mapping of the kind of hydrology and um, geology that are articulated in the surfaces to into kind of a series of, um, this series of objects that are symbolical uh, to a substrate formed from an earthen crust, but also that kind of creates this new protective barrier and remediation potential by nurturing new plants, while at the same time um, contributes to the creation of nursery as a community space. So um, these are kind of a couple strategies that we looked at. The, there were sort of three factors. One had to do with the water flow collection. Second was the kind of demassing or reducing shaping re relative to reduced mass and then balancing so things can actually distribute weight so it can um, really work as a, as a dynamic object. And um, we designed three of these um, morphologies that um, have sort of slightly different relationship to soil, water, and um, the environment. And the, the medium is this kind of a porous stone-like granule matter that it's the, it's the part where the exchange happens, whether that's hydrological, geological, or um, uh, the elements of embedded and carried into the form of 3D printed graffiti, which also starts thinking about, and we didn't do this, sort of, so the idea of braille as a, not our alternative form of accessibility and communication that can be kind of um, model, for, um, model for 
for rethinking how these technologies enable us to. I'm not sure why this is not. These technologies can. Um, the music is just for a move. Um, different <laughs> way of thinking of how uh, architecture can be formed in sort of a low impact environmental way to start carrying different kind of uh, communication devices. Um, so it's, the work is not just about like how the pieces are made or how they look, but really how they intersect with human interaction and imagination. This idea kind of urban play these were, was really important, so important to us. This were, we did a lot of testing. This was a half scale tests. And you can see like in terms of um, some of the structural work that we did in terms of the kind of a thinness of the sand print relative to the kind of a structural capacity to carry the cantilever is pretty significant. So, um, and um, so we work, we had the industrial partner X1. Um, we started, we, we worked with the kind of a limitation was the size of their printer. Um, and these are some of the installation pictures. Uh, early on before the landscape came in. Um, Hazelwood Green was home to Mill 19, which was once the industrial central of Hazelwood. This is Pittsburgh, uh, which is kind of a similar history to Detroit. Um, this is a place that provided employment opportunities, but because of the, you know, the industrial shift and significant air and soil pollution, um, the community today is still impacted by that. So the idea of kind of this kind of a the new form of development was also part of the larger conversation, how we can use the cutting edge technologies together with educational um, inclusive ways of participatory modes that starts really um, providing more conversation generating and inclusive space for, for redevelopment. So ultimately, the rockers cultivate new habitats. They um, kind of attune to more complex nature of culture and exposure to ecological intimacy within the space and um, propose sort of a ch engine for reconstituting uh, what used to be a troubled ground towards a environmental infrastructure that is more conducive to um, social space. So thank you. We have a couple minutes for questions. Um, so just kind of looking at like a lot of your things, um, it seems like a lot of things were like produced using like simulations to support your stuff, like especially the, with like your thermal walls. Mm -hmm. um, where do you find like a, a starting point on like the iterations in the simulations for, to, I guess, to start? Um, sound very echoey. Is this? Yeah. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. I think that um, understanding if your um, initial point is about what kind of processes, whether that's hydrological process or if it's about um, thermal process. Um, there's slightly different parameters of how the simulations are set up. But if you notice, there are also these kind of a, uh, similarities to how some of these elements behave or the kind of a, the simulation that are some, some way part of the design thinking. So we, and we're not engineers. I'm not, I mean, I am technically, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, it, the simulation is used as kind of a creative participant in a design process while we do collaborate with kind of an engineering space. They're not made up, but they're, they're also um, just a lot of it is observation and a lot of it is kind of understanding of a bigger, of the pro bigger, bigger problems of architecture like sound, right? We all know, like you realize you can't have a conversation in, not in this space, but in, I don't know, Wendy's, right? <laughs> So uh, just social behavior as a cue related to kind of then finding the tools and being maybe proactive about 
what tools we can find. And some of these are pretty easy to use. And then once you get into it, you can build up the, the knowledge to sort of play with them and see what they can do. So. Any more questions? I can hear you probably. <laughs> oh. Hi. Um, so you talked about the tender revolution and that kind of change in mindset. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of prior to that, a lot of people had kind of taken the industrial route taking away from the traditional practices of being more in touch with nature. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, since the tender revolution and a lot of other practices like that, we still haven't seen a lot of like interaction with the ecological approach like universally. So what do you think some of the sociocultural holdups are that are kind of stopping that from being more kind of Do you want to come work with me and figure this out? Because that's an excellent observation. Um, and, and really good question. Um, I, think, I think a lot of it has to do with sort of inequity with the um, access to education. Um, I've learned a lot with the sort of the last project collaborative where we actually work with kids and in a, some way to introduce them to 3D printing. And it's, it's, it's just, there's a super simple way of how you kind of enable somebody to have an agency to actually act on their own, where I think it's, to me, it's like early childhood education and understanding one's agency in terms of being able to make things. Um, I think historically, the, and st we still sort of think of um, technology as something that is part of the privilege of harder institutions, right? Or, um, part something that distances kind of a human gesture away from making something subjective. And I think especially now with um, the kind of ability to have much more easier access to some of these tools, which I think is still not the case, um, and giving agency to um, and kind of understanding how the um, what are we intimate with, not as, as kind of intellectually intimate with, what's good for us, what's kind of, I think the issue of an, a teaching environmental ethics and as a part of a pipeline towards understanding that ecology and technology are not separate, that they need to come together. Like we don't have that much of a natural stuff left, right? So in some way it's already technological by nature. So some of it is conceptual, some of it is, um, issues of, um, that's why I teach in some way. I don't have a good answer. It's a really good question. <laughs> There's one more. So um, you showed this um, conceptual or prototype form that you created that adapts to either, like you were talking about temperature and like mood or yeah. like the, mm -hmm. you know, and I was just wondering how, you thought that um, forms like this, whether it be a wall or, or a surface or mm -hmm. uh, furniture, whatnot, yeah. how it could best be incorporated, incorporated into architecture or interior design? So it was very literal. Um, in some way, the, um, um, in some way the, uh, the geometry of a surface was taken away from the kind of a cooling geometries, right? The, um, uh, the distribution of the, electromechanical heating pattern. The idea is that it's linked to our kind of alpha channels in the brain. I don't know if you guys seen in the science museums, you can put a, like a headset on your head and move the ball. Have you guys seen that? Okay, it's the same thing. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, in, in, it, it's more this idea of kind of how we can make architecture more, adaptive psychosomatically, right? So it's not just through this notion of ever, technology is rational. Rational produces statistical models, statistical model produces single solution. The solution is probably the best way to deal with community of people because somebody always has to suffer, right? So 
But if we have a possibility of, let's say, just within a temperature, to have kind of a different way of reactivity with the material, depending on how many people are there or what, how they think, what their sort of mood is, uh, to having slight more gradients or variation in the space. So that, that was the idea. I just want the wall to hug me when I need it. <laughs> Too, but there's no questions from online. I want to thank you, um, and and I know that Frank Melendez was here a couple weeks ago, which some of the students were here for that. And mm -hmm. I think there's a really nice overlap between the work. Um, it's also kind of mind blowing for me to, s at least in the way that you describe the the thermal mass, and that the mass can be the same. And and I think we we've existed for a long time in a way that you described, like, we have certain metrics, but the, the sculptural aspects of the work that you share, the, the just incredibly beautiful surfaces, at least for me, hopefully for others, feels like it brings in a, a renewed sense of agency, both to the way that we think about architecture, surface, ornament, digital design, fabrication, all of these things are kind of like now present in a way that have performative aspects in a way that for many years it felt like they didn't have performative aspects other than just simply formal. Right. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. I know our students have class at 2 o'clock. Uh, some of them, we've got a few minutes if people want to ask individual questions and kind of mill around. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you.